This video is part of the higher level topic C2.1 on chemical signaling, and we'll be taking a deep dive into signaling molecules and receptors. Theme C is all about interaction and interdependence, and in order for cells to interact with each other and really work together, they have to be able to communicate. And they're going to do that through signaling molecules, and those signaling molecules are going to need receptors. Another name for the signaling molecules are ligands, okay? So these ligands are shown over here in red, and they are gonna act as signaling molecules, and cells are gonna pick up on those signals if these ligands can bind with protein receptors. So I would find these protein receptors embedded in the membrane of cells if they have them, and they have on them a binding site for these ligands. Now, when this ligand binds with the protein receptor, it causes a slight change in the shape of this receptor protein. And that slight change in shape can cause this cascade of events. It can either cause some change in gene expression or it can kick off a series of cellular responses, but there's something about the binding and the changing of the shape that makes stuff happen. Now, if this is looking familiar to you and you're thinking enzymes, great, I love that because there are some things that are similar, right? So ligands are specific to their receptors just the way that enzymes are specific to the substrates that they can act on. The ligand also remains unchanged. So this is a little bit of a difference here, right? So in enzyme reactions, I would expect the substrate to be changed by the enzyme, but in this case, the ligand remains unchanged. So the ligand um, is not being worked upon. It's not being changed by this protein receptor. The magic here happens when they are together, okay? So in that way, they're just a tad bit different. I would say the other difference I would maybe think about here when I'm comparing it with enzymes is that when an enzyme connects with a substrate, it's like very quick enzyme changes substrate, psh, substrate, uh, those products are released and we all move on with our life. Here it's a little bit different. Here, not only is the ligand remaining unchanged, but it can actually remain seeded in and connected to this receptor for quite some time, okay? And so that that, that cellular response can last um, quite a long time. So it's good to notice some similarities, but keep our eye on some differences. Now, you can imagine if I have more of these ligands, more of these chemical messaging molecules, I'm going to have a greater response, okay? And so this is related to a phenomenon that we call quorum sensing. And this is a change in behavior of a colony, so a group of living organisms, when its population density reaches us the certain threshold. So you can imagine if I have more cells, okay, that are sending out more chemical messaging molecules, then at some threshold of messenger molecules, I'm gonna have a change in activity. So this is a great example of interdependence where if I just have a few cells sending out a few messenger molecules, I'm gonna get no great change. But if I have a lot of them, then I'm gonna see this difference. And there's a great example here here, um, in this Vibrio fisheri, this bacteria that is bioluminescent and has a mutualistic relationship with the bobtail squid. So in large enough numbers, this um, bacterium starts to bioluminesce. And that's, again, only going to happen when it reaches a certain population density you're gonna notice a lot of diversity in the types of chemical signaling molecules that cells employ. So this will include things like hormones, neurotransmitters, cytokinines, and calcium ions, just to name a few. And we'll start off by talking about hormones. Hormones come from endocrine glands, and endocrine glands are glands, glands that secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. You may have already studied exocrine glands, and they secrete non-hormone substances and not into the bloodstream, but through ducts. Endocrine glands, we need to be thinking bloodstream and hormones. And because they travel in the bloodstream, they're going to go all throughout the body. So how is it that we can control where those effects take place. 
Well, it has to do with receptor proteins. So only target cells are going to have the receptor protein capable of binding with that particular hormone. The hormones that are in the bloodstream floating past non-target cells, they don't have that receptor protein. So even though that hormone is there, it doesn't affect a change in this cell or in this tissue because it doesn't have the receptor protein. So this is a really interesting way of spreading messages here. Um, hormone messaging can have a long effect time. Um, some great examples here, insulin, glucagon, these have to do with glucose homeostasis. And then of course, course, sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. Um, again, we want to be thinking about target cells and receptors and how our cells utilize those to make sure that messages are only interpreted and acted upon by certain tissues. Next, we'll talk about neurotransmitters as examples of chemical signaling molecules. So these are much different from hormones. They don't travel in the blood. They only travel in a very small space between two neurons, and that small space is called a synapse. Maybe you've already studied synaptic transmission, but if not, here it is, okay? So it's a very isolated effect, whereas hormones are traveling all over the body. This is isolated, isolated to just just that one tiny junction between these two tiny nerves. They also have very short effect times. So these are very rapid chemical messaging um, mechanisms. And the reason for that is, is because these neurotransmitters are very quickly removed from the synapse. So we're gonna notice neurotransmitters being released by one neuron, and then they bind to another neuron. But almost immediately after that message is passed, these neurotransmitters here are either destroyed by enzymes or they are taken back up into this original neuron. So very short messaging time here. Some great examples. Examples, dopamine and serotonin, we might find those in the brain. Those are great um, neurotransmitters for different brain things. And then acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that can go between motor neurons and muscles. But the mechanism here is all the same. Now let's move on to our next messenger. These are cytokines, and these are proteins that are going to be passed between nearby cells. So this is really how cells in a tissue communicate with each other, especially if they're not nerve cells, right? Because nerve cells can use neurotransmitters. So what this will look like is that a cell will receive some kind of stimulus, okay, from the environment and produce these cytokines. Those cytokines will bind with receptors on nearby cells, which can produce some kind of effect. And that effect can really vary depending on the binding site. So different cells with different binding sites um, may have a different outcome. So some great examples, um, interferon, those are cytokines that are going to help with like inflammation processes and in, in our immune cells. So if one cell is infected with a virus, it can kind of like warn some cells nearby or kick off an immune response um, or erythropoietin can produce red blood cells. So again, these are chemical messenger molecules between two nearby cells. And the fourth one, calcium ions, these are a bit of a weirdo because the first three that we talked about, hormones, neurotransmitters, and cytokines, these are all biological molecules, okay? So some kind of like protein or lipid, something like that. Calcium ions, are exactly what they sound like. They're a calcium ion, but still with the right receptor on the right target cell, these calcium ions can do some pretty amazing things. So two really great examples here. One is with muscle fibers. So when we have a muscle contraction, calcium ions are going to really allow that myosin head to bind with actin. So if you haven't already studied musculature and the sliding film theory. Here's a quick review. Um, a protein called myosin has to bind with another protein called actin because that is what slides muscles inward and helps them to contract. But almost all of the time, there is a fiber covering up the binding site on this actin molecule, and that's going to prevent the myosin from binding. Well, if we want a muscle to contract, then our muscle cells need to secrete these calcium ions. And the calcium ions bind to this um, 
protein that's covering the binding sites on actin and it moves it out of the way and that allows myosin to bind to actin so before we can even start with a muscle contraction it has to begin with a calcium ion secretion first then if we want to think about neurons, again, if you haven't studied synaptic transmission yet, that's okay. But we already know about neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters have to be released into the synapse. That is going to be initiated by the influx of calcium ions into this presynaptic neuron. So calcium ions are going to have to move in here in order to get these neurotransmitters to be secreted out of the cell. So it's a great example here of chemical signaling molecules having different effects um, on different types of cells. Throughout the different topics on physiology, I think you're going to find that hormones and neurotransmitters are talked about with much greater frequency. So let's take a deeper dive into those two. They evolve separately many times, and we know this because they are so different. They have such different forms, they have different functions. It's not possible that they all derived from the same chemical family. However, they do have some things in common. Um, they are both very small molecules and they are soluble in water. And we know that they have shapes that are compatible with their receptors. So that's true of both hormones and of neurotransmitters. No one expects you to be an organic chemist and understand what exactly all of these different uh, chemical groups are, but you are expected to have an appreciation for the diversity of different chemical structures that make up both hormones and neurotransmitters. So hormones can consist of things like steroids, like testosterone, amines, like melatonin, or peptides like insulin. And all of those are hormones, um, but they consist of very different chemical structures. They are considered hormones because of the way that they work and where they come from in our body, not necessarily what their structure is. And we can say the same thing as neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters have the same mechanism and they all come from neurons, but they have very, very different chemical um, structures. So it could be like nitrous oxide, it could be a glutamate, it could be um, a dopamine here, it could be esters like acetylcholine. So again, all of these are neurotransmitters but have very different chemical structure and that's really the main learning here. In addition to their different um, chemical structure, their effects are also quite different if we're comparing hormones and neurotransmitters. So again, hormones can act over large distances because they are traveling through the blood um, to a variety of target cells. And again, only target cells with that receptor are going to be affected by that hormone. Neurotransmitters, on the other hand, are going to have a much lo more localized effect because they're only traveling the distance between two neurons. So I know on this page or on this screen, it looks like this distance and this distance are the same. They are not. So imagine uh, a hormone being produced um, in the pituitary gland, but it really acts on the ovaries. That's a lot of distance. This we're talking about nanometers, okay, between two neurons. So a much more localized effect here. So now let's reframe our thinking. Let's think about another way to categorize these, not in terms of their chemical structure or whether they're a neurotransmitter or a hormone or a cytokine. Let's just go ahead and come up with a new categorization, a simple one. Can they enter the cell or not? Because whether or not a chemical messenger molecule can enter the cell is going to dictate a lot about what kind of receptor protein that we need. Okay, so if a signaling molecule can enter the cell, then its receptor protein is going to be located inside the cell. And that's what this word intra means, inside. So the receptor is intracellular, intracellular receptor, because a signaling molecule can enter the cell. 
that means that the receptor is going to have to be covered in hydrophilic amino acids. Okay, so this refers to the surface of the receptor. And that is going to be very important because this receptor is floating around in the cytoplasm and it must be dissolved, okay? So this cytoplasm is made primarily up of water and so it's important that this receptor is soluble in water if it's gonna be hanging out in this cell. So a great example here are things like steroid hormones there are other things that can do this. This is just an example, but this steroid hormone can enter the cell. It's, it is hydrophobic, so it's going to enter the cell and bind with this intracellular receptor, which is covered in hydrophilic amino acids, and then it can go off and do its things, and we'll talk about that later, okay? But just a little bit of a difference here that can be a little tricky. The hormone itself is hydrophobic. It's nonpolar. That's how it's able to get past these hydrophobic tails in the membrane. The receptor is covered in hydrophilic amino acids because it must be dissolved in the solutions on the inside of the cell. That will be very different for molecules that cannot enter the cell. So something like non-steroid hormones like insulin, let's say, insulin can't get into the cell. It just can't. It's not hydrophobic. It can't get past those tails. So it would not make sense for that receptor to be inside the cell because the molecule can't get in the cell. So its receptor protein is going to be embedded in the plasma membrane, and we call that a transmembrane protein. It spans both sides of the membrane. So the receptor has a part sticking outside of the membrane and a part sticking inside of the membrane. A trans transmembrane protein. And because it needs to be a transmembrane protein, it needs to have hydrophilic and hydrophobic amino acids. So remember, these hydrophobic tails are hydrophobic, and this part of that transmembrane protein needs to be covered in hydrophobic amino acids. However, on those um, phosphate or phospholipids, those heads are hydrophilic. They are water-loving. So on a transmembrane protein, those amino acids in that area also need to be hydrophilic. So there are some things to consider um, when building these transmembrane transmembrane proteins for molecules that cannot sit outside of the cell, okay, or that cannot enter the cell. So some big implications there. Okay, so just to sum things up here, and I'll maybe try to color code these differently, we're going to need transmembrane receptors for signaling molecules that cannot enter the cell. For signaling molecules that can enter the cell, I can have an intracellular receptor because it can enter the cell.